What's up, everybody? Answer video time is here. I got a lot of really good questions. I, I was I was kind of shocked, given that you know my my subscriber base is a subset of the internet. I got a lot of shitty questions too, but uh, a lot of good ones. It allowed me to be really picky with the ones that I wanted to answer, and I still have a really long list of of, of questions to answer. Uh, so yeah, let's kick it off. I've got some some. I got a couple of bottles of blue Gatorade G2. You know, because I, I anticipate this is going to take me a while. I might even, like, take a break at some point and come back and finish later. I don't know. We'll see how it works. We'll see how it works. So let's uh, let's move right along. Why do you think people believe 9-11 conspiracy theories? Well, let me ask you this. What makes you think I don't believe 9-11 conspiracy theories? Like, What makes you think I would have insight into the head of people who do? Uh, other than the fact that I am one. Uh, look, here's the deal with conspiracy theories, and this is something that's troubled me about the information age. There seems to be this large and growing subset of people that when they hear a quote-unquote conspiracy theory, um, they automatically dismiss that person as a fucking loon. You're a nut job, ah, oh, conspiracy theory, you're a truther. Um, and they throw these people, you know, into this category where, they, where they're just like, ah, oh, this is just a bunch of whack jobs. And I'm wondering, like, at what point did, like, conspiracies become this fantasy thing? Like, look, I, I know there are a lot of really crazy conspiracy theories out there. But there are also, like, actual conspiracies, proven conspiracies. Um, with regards to 9-11, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this much. I don't believe for a fucking second that the American government has been truthful with the American people with regards to what happened on that day. And um, that doesn't mean that I believe that it was some huge, you know, like there were charges planted in the buildings. Um, uh, space aliens uh, conferred with President Bush and planned the whole thing. I, but, I, but I do think, I, and I don't think I'm off base in saying this, I do think that uh, in some ways the American government could have been complicit in the attacks on 9-11. Um, and, and there's something about that day, and, and, and may, my non-American subscribers might not be able to understand where I'm coming, through, uh, c coming from with this, but there's something about that day that causes such an immediate emotional response in people. And I think that maybe that's what it is. I think people have this picture of what happened on 9-11 in their head. And it's like sacred ground for them, not 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 literally, but that too. But you know, like in their in their mind, that little space that 9/11 occupies in their mind is sacred. And anybody that wants to ask questions about it is a loon and a kook and a fucking whack job. And how dare you disrespect the people that died that day? And and uh, uh, look, uh, the American government has a nice storied history of of lying to the American people. Um, you, you look at something like the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which was used to great effect by the Johnson administration to massively escalate the war in Vietnam. Uh, that it never happened. It never happened. That is a lie that the American government told that led to the deaths of thousands of American soldiers and countless thousands of Vietnamese people. It was a lie told to the American people to get them to support a war that was against their best interests. The American government has done this in the past. If you want something a little more recent, let's think about it this way. Look at the war in Iraq, okay? Does everybody remember the type of shit we were told in the lead-up to the war in Iraq? Do you remember, like, I remember distinctly being told that Saddam Hussein had a fleet of unmanned drones that were capable of transat transatlantic unmanned flight, right? They, they could fly across the Atlantic Ocean and reach the eastern seaboard of the United States carrying uh, biological agents or dirty nuclear material. And, and because they were so small and could fly so low, they were completely invisible to our radar. We were told that, that he had this shit. That was a blatant fucking lie. A lot of people would say, no, Paul, that was bad intelligence. No, that was a fucking lie. It was a fucking lie that we were told amongst a sea of fucking lies. Look at all the shit that we were told by this government to get, to, 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 to get our support for this war that's killed thousands of our soldiers and hundreds of thousands, if, if not more, Iraqis. Um, you know, he had these mobile weapons labs. You remember, you remember Colin Powell testifying uh, at the UN that he had these like 
they look like normal semi trucks with trailers, but 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 they're actually like Optimus Prime. You remember Optimus Prime back in the day? The toy had he, he was a truck, and then he had a trailer that would like open up and like a satellite dish came out and guns and shit. Like we were told that Saddam Hussein had these like mobile weapons, you know, biological weapons factories and shit, and none of that was even close to the truth. I so so you can't call it bad intelligence. Somebody made it up. Somebody made it up. The people in power probably knew it was made up, but they used it anyway. They used it anyway to galvanize support for a war that worked against everybody in this country's worst interests, or best interests. Worked directly against our best interests. So the government has this storied history of lying to the American people. The Bay of Pigs, um, Iran-Contra. <coughs> Look into it. You know what I mean? So what, what makes you think that something is catalyzing, like the most catalyzing event in the last two decades would be any different. What, what, the American government is just being completely open and honest this time. This time. Trust me this time. I know I've done nothing but lie to you <laughs> your entire life, but this time I'm telling the truth. Um, I don't think the American people have heard the truth of what happened on 9-11. I think that there were probably elements of the American government um, that if they were not directly involved in planting bombs or something were at least aware of this, that this was going to happen, or aware that something like this was going to happen, and realized that it was going to be a catalyzing event that would open the door to all kinds of uh, foreign war. Because make no make no bones about it, there's a small but very influential group of people in this country to which war is not this horrible thing. War is a huge business. There were people that when we invaded Afghanistan and invaded Iraq, uh, in, instead of being worried. They, they cheered. They stood up on their chairs and said, fucking hallelujah, we're in the money. We're, this is big business. And, and, and big business owns the government. So, um, to, to think that there wouldn't be any malfeasance there, I don't know. I think that's a bigger conspiracy theory, to be, to be honest with you, than most of the shit I hear about 9-11. The fact that the American government told the truth about something, um, that, that catalyzing and that huge. Uh, so there you go. Um, you now have one and only video game to play for the rest of your life, any console, any genre. Uh, how do you not choose your favorite video game of all time? Um, my favorite video game of all time is the original Diablo for the PC. And, uh, you know, I, I, it has some elements about it that would make it good for a game, that, you know, that, that if it was the only game I'd ever play again. Um, it's randomized, like the dungeons in Diablo, and I won't go into too much detail, but the dungeons in Diablo are randomized um, so that uh, every time you play the game, it's different. So there would be really no way for me to like memorize exactly where every little item is and where's this boss and, and what's in this room. You know, Every time I play the game, it's a different experience. The dungeons are random. The loot that you get is random. Um, so that, that's kind of cool. Uh, but I just love Diablo. I, it's one of those games that I can sit down and play, and I'm never sick of playing it. I, I can boot it up today, and it feels just as awesome as it did, or at least almost just as awesome as it did the first day I played it back in the 90s. You know what I mean? Um, one of the bad things about it, though, is that a big part of the Diablo experience for me was the multiplayer. Like in Diablo, when it first came out, you could play your own game, you know, go kill demons and get loot and, you know, a nice shiny coat of you know, chain, chain mail of the moon or whatever <laughs> with all kinds of magical properties. I'm such a fucking dork. Um, anyway, yeah, no, but that shit, that shit really, that gives me a nerd boner. Um, but uh, you could also enter somebody else's game. So you could take that character and enter somebody else's game in progress, right? And then you could actually hunt down and kill that person. One of the things that Diablo 2 fucked up was that it made this PvP thing consensual. So you could, like, have a duel. Who fucking wants to duel? Like, I want to go into somebody's game and hunt them. And there was always this palpable sense of dread when somebody joined your game. You know, because you knew that they... There's really no other reason to just randomly join a fucking game. You know they were coming for you. And, and, and the big question is, are they going to be able to find you? Are they going to be able to get you? You know what I mean? And when they do, can you take them? And it was awesome. That, that, that feeling was awesome. I'd never played a game that had that feeling, that dread, you know, when you saw another player. Like who's going to, you know, like, like an Old West showdown or something. Like who's going to fucking, who's, who's going to jump this off first? Or maybe you're just here to hang out. I don't know. 
Um, but yeah, Diablo, Diablo was awesome. The multiplayer in Diablo. I'll tell you a little story about multiplayer in Diablo. I have this friend, Waylon, um, who might come up in later stories as this question and answer video goes on. I have this friend, Waylon, uh, that was really clueless with Diablo. Me and my other friends were playing Diablo. We were playing together all the time. And then Waylon got it. And he was like, oh, man, guys, you got to come help me out Diablo. And so we all joined his game, right? And uh, he's running around. We're helping him kill shit, and we're giving him all the loot and all the money and stuff that he finds. We're trying to help him get his character leveled up. And as this is going on, I'm talking to my friend John, who's in the game as well, <clears throat> on ICQ. That used to be our instant messenger back then. I don't even know if ICQ still exists. Um, but we're talking on ICQ, and John is like, Dude, we should kill Waylon. We should kill Waylon and take all of his money. Here, here's, her, here's what happened to Diablo when you got killed. If you were killed by a monster, you dropped everything. Literally everything on your body. All of your armor, all your weapons, all the rings and magical amulets and shit that you spent all this time collecting. You literally went, oh, your guy fell over and all your shit just flew off of your body. You know, like your cha your pants came off and flew over there, and your fucking hat came off and flew over there. If you were killed by a player, you only dropped half your gold. Um, and so we, he, he was like, dude, we should kill him and take his gold. And I was like, no, no, we, I want him to play with us. Let's just be nice. But he was totally clueless. And as time went on, this started to sound like a better and better idea. And <laughs> finally I said, fuck it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So what you could do in Diablo if you were a real dick, because like I said, if you were killed by a player, you drop half your gold. Right, So it's not a huge loss. I mean, it still sucked, but it's not a huge loss. But what you could do is you could kill a person and then cast a spell called Firewall right on top of their body. Firewall you know, creates a giant wall of fire that deals damage constantly as long as you're standing in it. And then you could resurrect that person. When you resurrect a person, they come back with like one hit point. So what would happen is you'd, you'd kill somebody, cast a Firewall on their body, and then resurrect them over and over again. And every time they die, <laughs> I'm such a dork. Every time they die, they would drop half their gold. You know, so 50%, 50%, and down to the point where they only had one gold. So I did this to Waylon. I fucking killed him. And I'm laughing my ass off. I'm hysterically laughing. Raising him over and over again. It's just, uh, 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 and little piles of gold are flying everywhere. You can't beat that. You know what I mean? You can't beat that. So, yeah. But I only had one game to play for the rest of my life. I went in, into way more detail than you wanted, but I think that's going to be a running theme. <laughs> It'd be Diablo, the original Diablo. Paul, what's your biggest regret in life? Just a personal but fun question. This is going to be a long one. This is going to be one that takes me a while to answer because I want to be candid and I want to be thorough with this. My biggest regret in life is the last relationship that I was in prior to my current relationship. Um, it was six years, and it was probably the worst six years of my life. For those of you that have ever been in a really destructive relationship, you'll, you'll understand what I was saying. This girl and I were horrible for one another. Absolutely just horrible. We brought out the worst in one another. And so I'll tell the story of how we met, kind of what happened, and, and, and the aftermath of this on my life to give you context of my biggest regret. So right after high school, I started to go to college. And uh, I was hanging out, surprise, surprise, in front of the theater building at, at, at the college. And all of a sudden, I hear this voice say, Polly? And I look up, and this beautiful woman, this gorgeous woman, is running towards me. And I have no idea who she is. Absolutely no fucking clue. All my friends call me Polly. Um, <laughs> and now everybody you know, on my YouTube channel is going to call me Polly. Um, but anyway, she's running towards me, and I'm like, who the fuck is that? She throws her arms around me like she's a long-lost friend that I haven't seen in 20 years. She kisses me on the cheek. And she's like, oh, my God, you know, I can't believe it's you. It's been so long. And after we stopped hugging, I looked at her, and finally, after 10 or 15 seconds of intensely, like, panicking because she obviously knows me really well and I have no clue. I figured out who it was and it was this girl that I went to high school with. She was three years older than me or four years older than me. Um, and we, we met in high school through drama. We were in drama together. She graduated, but I continued to hang out with her and her group of friends, even though they were no longer in high school. 
And uh, we lost touch my last year of high school or something, and I hadn't seen her. And the reason I didn't recognize her was, and, and I'm not making fun, I'm not trying to be an asshole. Back in high school, she was a really big girl. And I'm not, you know, I'm a fat guy, okay? And I like to think that there are, like, levels of fatness. And I think of myself, you know, getting teetering up towards the high end of medium fat. That makes sense. And then there are people that are just morbidly obese, like, you know, have trouble getting around without a scooter obese. And she never used a scooter, but she was really big. And uh, in the time that we lost touch, she had gotten uh, bariatric surgery, gastric bypass, which is really popular in, in the United States for people that are really, really overweight. And uh, had lost something like 200 pounds. And she was absolutely, like, model gorgeous at this point. And I was blown away. So I spent that whole day with her. I ditched the rest of my classes, which would become uh, a pretty regular thing in my college career. <laughs> um but I ditched the rest of my classes, you know, she took her out to lunch, and we hung out and talked and had a great time together. I brought her back to the campus to drop her off at her car, and uh, she gets out, and I get out to give her a hug, and she gives me a hug, and she puts her mouth, like, right against my ear. And for me, that's, that's, that's hot, you know what I mean? Like, my ears, like when a chick, like, nibbles your ear, she puts her mouth, like, right against, and we're hugging, and she, she, she leans over and puts her mouth, like, right against my ear, and she whispers, she says, you're going to call me, right? And I said, yeah, yeah, of course. I got your number. You know, it, it sucks that we lost touch. We need to catch up. And she goes, no, 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 no. You don't understand. You're going to call me, and I'm going to fuck your brains out. Now, for a lot of guys, the reaction would be, um, what are you doing right now? Can I go to a pay phone? Because, like, we could go now, especially if you saw this girl. She's gorgeous. But for me, you got to put yourself in my shoes here. At this point in my life, I'm an 18-year-old virgin. I'm just out of high school. I'm still living at home with my parents. For all intents and purposes, I consider myself to be a kid still. I'm still a kid. You know what I mean? I have, I've never had sex. I've certainly never had like a full-grown... At this point, she's 21, maybe 22 years old. Um, I've never had a, a, a grown woman threatened to fuck my brains out. You know what I mean? It freaked me out. I said, oh. <laughs> and she got in her car and left, and I got in my car and left, and I never called her. Um, I was free. I, I'm sorry. I know. There are people face palming, and I face palm sometimes too when I think about it, but um, I just, I, it, was, it freaked me out. So anyway, a few months later, I'm at my dad's. I'm still living with my dad at this point. And, uh, I had this great setup at my dad's house. He had a two story house and all the other bedrooms were upstairs and I had the only downstairs bedroom and it faced the front of the house. So when everybody else went to bed, I pretty much had the run of this entire house and my friends could come over and just come in through my window. Like I took the screen off the window and they knew that, you know, if my light was on, they could just come and knock or let themselves in while well, I'm laying there one night like midnight or something, watching TV, and I hear somebody at my window. And I'm thinking, oh, that's one of my asshole friends. So I get up to let this person in, and it's this girl. And I still, to this day, have no idea how she knew um, that she was allowed to just come over to my house and come in through the window. I, don't, I have no clue. Um, it's a mystery. But there she is. And she's got this little, uh, little uh, shopping bag filled to the brim with alcohol. She was working as a bartender at this point in time. Yeah, so she's a bartender, and I'm at this. And now I'm 19. I've turned 19 since the since the run-in that I had with her earlier. I'm 19, and and a bartender is crawling through my window, and she proceeds to get me really, really drunk, and we end up in my dad's hot tub out in the backyard, and she is trying her best to rape me, um, just totally all over me, and I was so, I was so nervous, you know what I mean, <laughs> like. And it was, it, for me, looking back on it, it was a combination of, like, never had sex, never had sex, have no idea what this is going to be like, and this is a grown woman, and I'm still a kid. Ah, uh, you know, like, what if I, it's going to be horrible, and she's going to laugh at me. Uh, and so I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And then finally I said, look, I said, I don't want this to be, you know, we're really good friends. I don't want, <laughs> such a dumb excuse. <laughs> I don't want this to just be like a, I don't want to do this like this. Like I want to get to, can we, can we get to know each other a little? Can we, can we spend some time, 
You know what I mean? I, I I would love for us to be a thing. Like I'd love to. I don't even know how you put it. It probably came out exactly like this. But I don't want to just fuck. You know what I mean? Can we just? I didn't tell her at this point that I was a virgin. And she was like, okay. So we dated, and that and that really noble stance that I took lasted, I think, a week, <laughs> and I lost my virginity. Um, and and uh, for those of you that asked how my first time was, or to tell the story of my first time. It was just about as embarrassing and short as most people's first times. I know maybe there's some Don Juan motherfuckers out there that like had porn sex their first time, but for me it was like four, the, it was the it was the best 45 seconds of my life up until that point. And uh, at that afterwards, I told her, "Look, I, I'm sorry, I was a virgin." She said, "Yeah, I kind of assumed," and I, it's like, you know, but she was okay with it. And and because I was still super young, like. Five minutes later, I was ready to go again. And then the, the next time I had sex was markedly better, and it improved. But this relationship turned really intense really quickly. Because we knew each other so well before, I think we skipped over a lot of the shit that happens normally when you date a person. You know what I mean? We already knew each other. We knew each other's quirks. We knew what what we liked and what we didn't like. We had all this history together. So this relationship got super intense really fast. And, um, you know, I love yous came real quick, <laughs> you know, it seemed abnormal, but we, it was really intense. We were all over each other constantly. And, uh, about six months into our relationship, my dad found out that I had dropped out of college. I was lying and telling him I was still going to college. And in fact, I was not attending college anymore. Um, my dad got really pissed and told me that I had two months to get the fuck out of his house, um, that I had broken the little contract that I had with him, which was, you know, you have a place to stay as long as you're in school. I lied to him. He wanted me out. And I made a really tough decision. I had a friend that moved to Arizona. I, I grew up in California and lived in California at this point and live in California now. Uh, but I, I had this friend that after high school, he'd moved to Arizona and gone to school there. And he was constantly calling me from Arizona saying, Paul, you got to move down here. You got to, you got to come to Arizona. And, uh, it's a great place. Awesome jobs. And I decided that that's what I was going to do. And I broke her heart and, uh, she never forgave me for it. Um, because I, I, I felt like at that point in time, I needed to get out. I needed to get away from my family. I needed to get away from my friends I needed to learn what it was to be an adult and be on my own and pay my own bills and have a job and an apartment. And I didn't think that was going to be possible for me. I could have moved in with a friend and slept on a friend's couch. I could have moved in with her and slept on her couch or something. But I didn't even consider that shit. I wanted to do it right, but it broke her heart. And I don't think throughout the entirety of our relationship she ever forgave me for that. Um, and I begged her, you know, please move down there with me. Just come on. You know, her job wasn't all that great. I said, you don't have anything going here. I don't have it. Let's just go together. Let's do it together. And she said, I can't. I can't do it. And then finally she relented and said, look, I can't go when you go, but uh, let me tie up some loose ends around here and I'll come down eventually. And that's the point. Here's where the biggest regret comes into it. That's the point where our relationship should have ended. And I wish I was mature enough at that point to see that I should have just broke that relationship off because the prospect of having six or eight months worth of a long-term relationship, um, it doesn't work. And um, that's my biggest regret. I wish I could have gone back to that point in my life and stopped myself from perpetuating that relationship because up until that point, we'd had this beautiful relationship. I, I think that had it ended there, it would be a sad, but, 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 but in a lot of ways, really joyous memory for me because we, we were really like intensely in love. We loved each other and, 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 and would have done anything for one another. And to have the relationship break up there, yeah, it would have been ugly, but I think I would have had, I, I would have good memories of that relationship, whereas I have nothing but ugly <laughs> memories of that relationship. So I moved to Arizona, I got a job and got an apartment and then she moved down and things were okay for a couple of months and then our relationship was shit and it drug on for five years. Um, and it was just, it was emotionally abusive it, at, at some points it got physically abusive not me. I'm not a, I'm not a punch. I'm not a wife puncher, <laughs> but, 
uh, I was like one of those Mori Povich guys that goes on Mori Povich and, and, and is the, the battered. She would get really, like when we'd argue, she was really physical. And I don't, I don't know if it fucked me up or not, but it sucked. I mean, you, nobody likes being slapped and hair pulled and shit. Um, and it was a nasty, ugly relationship. And I never would have ended it. And we ended up living in Arizona for three years. We moved back to California. Our relationship was horrible on every level. Um, and yet it was outwardly one of those relationships that everybody that I knew was really jealous of. They were like, oh, you guys are so good together. You, Oh, you guys are the greatest couple. And, and we played that role in public. But in private, we just couldn't stand to be around each other. And it was really hurtful and, and ugly. And the best thing that she ever did for me was to finally leave me one day. She left me uh, out of the blue one day. She was she she had gone to house sit for a friend or some I don't know I don't know what it was. One of her friends had broken up with her boyfriend and and she went to go stay with her overnight. She was crying and I called her the next day and she's like I'm not coming home. And it devastated me. It was to this point the most devastating thing that ever happened to me because I was so invested in the relationship even though it was ugly. I was so invested and so believed that I would have done anything to perpetuate that relationship. And it just, you know, I never would have ended it. I was so committed. And she she did. She left me, and it was the worst thing that ever happened. I mean, it just it devastated me. It completely uprooted me from my life. I developed really rapidly a huge drug problem because of it. <laughs> Um, I started, uh, you know, and up until this point, I wasn't exactly chased when it came to drugs. Uh, but I started, you know, I was smoking a lot of weed and, and drinking a lot anyway. Uh, but I started, you know, all the time, you know, whereas, you know, maybe it was like every weekend or maybe two or three times a week I would get drunk or smoke weed. It was every day before work, after work, all night long to like fell asleep crying. It was really that pathetic. Fell asleep crying. <laughs> And then on top of it, I started popping pills. I started taking Vicodin by the handful. And anybody that's ever taken those three types of drugs at once knows that this feeling that you get when you're spun on Vicodin and high and drunk off your ass all at once, it's this complete out-of-body experience. You're just like, you're not even a human anymore. You're an animal. You know what I mean? You're just, uh, I mean, literally that bad. There are times where I dragged myself into bed and I remember thinking, I'm not going to wake up. Like, if I go to sleep, I'm not going to wake up. And I was okay with it. It's probably the closest to suicidal I've ever been. I wasn't actively, at least consciously, attempting to overdose or kill myself. But I would have been okay with it, you know, <laughs> if I had just died. And uh, it, left, it, it, it still, to this day, affects the person that I am. It's probably one of the most galvanizing moments I've had growing up. Um, and it, and it put a scar on me that'll never heal. It'll never heal. That'll never fully go away for me. And it's adversely affected every relationship that I've been in since then in one way or another. And I've worked really hard to work through the issues. And, and luckily I have a very understanding wife who I've told this story to and understands, um, how painful that was for me, that period of time and that whole relationship. But yeah, that's my biggest regret. Really roundabout way, probably a lot more info than you wanted, but there you go. Uh, if you won $5 million in the lottery today, what would you do with the money? Um, I don't know. Probably what most people would do. I would take care of my parents first and my nieces and nephews. Um, I would make sure my parents' house was paid off. My parents, uh, specifically speaking here, my mom and stepdad, are the two hardest working people I've ever known in my entire life. They, they um, have a work ethic that just do I don't even think really exists in the world anymore. And they bust their asses. My mom has worked at the same factory my entire life. And she does a job that a lot of people these days would consider to be a man's job. I mean, she's, she's driven these giant front-end loaders. She, she stacks, stacks things. You know, it's called hand stacking. Um, she just busts her fucking ass every day of her life. And if I won $5 million, the first thing I would do is pay their home off put a nest egg for them so that I knew that they would have enough money to do whatever they wanted, or at least within reason, you know, $5 million these days is not really that much money. Um, but I, I'd want to make sure that they were taken care of that they had. And then, and then I have a lot of little nieces and nephews that I'd want to make sure had a college fund, you know what I mean? So that they could get a good, get into a good school. And then I would probably pay off my house, pay off, you know, actually our cars are paid off. 
you know, pay off my bills and, and, um, I don't know. I don't know. That, that, those are the main things, though. Take care of the people that took care of me growing up. Um, here's a long one. My, my entire family is completely shut off to science and only believe what the Bible says. No matter how many times I tell them that something as minuscule as the age of the earth will not and cannot contradict the Bible, they brush it off and dance around the question. I was wondering if you've been in this sort of situation with family or friends and how you ultimately uh, dealt with it. Okay. Um, well, yes, I've been in this situation with family and friends. And I'll tell you, uh, growing up, I, I have one biological sister. And we were very close growing up. We went through my parents' divorce, which was kind of an ugly thing. And we, we, we were always really good to each other. We took care of each other. She's younger than I am, so I was the big brother, you know. And, um, and, we, and we had a lot in common personality-wise. Uh, she was a lot like me. She was like a little female me. You know what I mean? We were both smart asses. We both, uh, you know, laugh at the same shit. We have the same sense of humor. And earlier when I mentioned I moved to Arizona, when I moved to Arizona, I came back to visit about a year into moving to Arizona. And when I came back, I didn't recognize my sister anymore. She had started dating this guy that was a born again Christian. She's now married to him and had gotten born again, saved and was now this really, really hardcore evangelical Christian. And this was hard for me. I did not take this well because here's this person that I had this really, you know, I loved my sister, you know what I mean? And, 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 and to see, to see her personality completely changed. Um, I hated her boyfriend. I hated the guy that she married at this, at this point. And I couldn't, I, and I couldn't understand why she was acting this way. And on the, on the flip side, I was aggressive in that way, and she was what Christians, I've heard Christians call a baby Christian. Um, you know, she's a young person that got saved, and she was really zealous. She wanted to save everybody in her family, and she had no qualms just preaching at people, preaching at people. You know what I mean? Pull you aside and have a talk about Jesus with you all the time. It's all she wanted to do. And uh, at this point, I hadn't told anybody I was an atheist. In fact, I don't even know that I'd admitted to myself at this point that I was a full-blown atheist. I, you know, I called myself an agnostic for a long time and had no idea what it actually meant. Um, but I was definitely not a Christian. I was not a Christian at all. And, and being the argumentative guy that I was, I was fully willing to have it out with her and call her on her bullshit right to her face. And her husband, her then boyfriend, but then husband would get involved too. And they would both try and gang bang Christian me. You know what I mean? And I took out all the frustration that I felt about her changing so dramatically um, on this argument and it went back and forth like that for a long time. And then I finally moved back, uh, to, to California and had basically no relationship with my sister. I'd see her every once in a while. Um, but every time we saw each other, it ended in a fight and years, you know, go, go by and I start dating my current wife. And one night my mom invited us all over to dinner. Um, so she, <laughs> She invites us over to dinner, and it's me and my then-girlfriend and my mom and stepdad and my sister and her husband. They were married at this point. We sit down at dinner, and this was right when the Iraq War was kicking off. And my wife and I have a lot in common when it comes to politics, and, and, and uh, we're vehemently, vehemently anti-war people. I was, you know, I, I was anti-war before the Iraq War, but the Iraq War, I think, even, even more so than, than the war in Afghanistan, really galvanized my, my anti-war uh, feelings. And, uh, we start talking about the Iraq war and it mushrooms into this big religious conversation. And my sister is screaming and I'm screaming at her and my wife is jumping in and her husband is jumping in. And at one point my stepdad just got up and left the table. And it was at this point, number one, I felt horrible because I'm the oldest, right? I'm the oldest of the siblings. And I felt like it was really my duty to stop this conversation um, before it got out of hand like that. And uh, I didn't, you know what I mean? I allowed it to go there. And I was so mad when I left. And they left, They got up in a huff and left. And I pulled my parents aside before I left. And I said, I'm so sorry, guys. I said, that will never happen again, I promise you. I said, I disrespected you. I disrespected your home. And um, I should have known better. And it will never happen again. And I was so mad. I, I went home and I was so mad. The whole way home, I yelled at my wife, and not not at her, you know, but like just fucking how, 
fucking bitch and god the fucking cocksucker of a husband and how could they fucking how could she be so wrong what the fuck happened to her you know and i set, I, I i took the next week and i really thought about it and this is and this is the hard decision that you have to make when you're in my position i asked myself do i want to have a relationship of any meaning with my sister do i want her to be a part of my life and i chose yes and in order to do that, that means I have to step down and stop talking to her about these things. And it's a fucked up situation to be in because I'm, I, I had to make the decision. She didn't make the decision. She's just as openly uh, conservative and Christian and ju just as oh, she prays. You know, every time we, I have a meal with her, she makes everybody hold hands around the table and pray. And I hold hands and stare off into space. I'm the one that has to deal with the consequences of her decision. It could, it, there was nothing mutual about it. I made the decision to stop pursuing it, to be to to to, to keep myself because it was it was either that or I would not have any relationship with my sister, uh, or my niece and nephew who have been born since then. And I made that decision, and it's a fucked up decision to make, and it feels really one sided. Um, but I had to do it. That's what I had to do, and you're you're probably going to be faced with the same decision at some point in your life, and it's fucked, but it is it is what it is. Um, what's the most fucked up thing you've ever consciously done and regretted? <laughs> e. This is going to be an embarrassing story to tell. This is not. I'm not relishing telling this story, but I'm. I'm. I, look. What am I going to do? Am I going to be uh, untruthful? It's the whole point of this is to be candid. <sighs> Excuse me. Um, when I was 16 years old, on the internet, there was this website called M Player, M, the letter M Player. And it was a video game based website that would allow people to play multiplayer games together and have voice chat. Now, now nowadays, voice over IP, things like TeamSpeak and, 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 and all that, it's, it's a foregone conclusion in video gaming. But this was new. Being able to chat over the internet via voice with somebody you're playing a game with was huge. And it wasn't just a gaming community. There were all these little chat voice chat rooms that would, that would spring up. And... One of the ones that really took off was called a fight room. And this is where people would go in and insult each other. You know, say things to each other. It was, it was like almost, it was almost like the beginnings for me of what the internet really is, which is a bunch of people saying a bunch of shit to people that if they were like in person, they'd never say. You know what I mean? And that's what this fight room was all about. And there, and little personalities started to, to shine out in this fight room. The more I went to it, the more I started to learn about people. And there was one chick that would go to these fight rooms, and her name was Meredith. And she was an asshole. I mean, she was so good at this whole fight room thing, and so was I. And what you should know about me, too, is at 16, I sounded like I sound now. My, my voice dropped. When I was 12, like I went from, you know, a squeaker you know, one day, and I, I came to I came to school one day, and I was like, "Hey guys, want to go out of the playground?" And that was it. You know what I mean? So at 16 years old, I sounded like an adult. I've always I, th this timbre of voice is what I had basically at 16. So everybody in the room started to get to know who I was because I was a huge fucking asshole, and I would you know we called it capping on people or ragging on people or busting on people. And I would I would just murderously uh, assault people and 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 fuck on them in this in this chat room, and this other girl and I started talking outside of the chat room, because we were both real assholes. And then we found out, you know, when we actually got to talking, we were actually pretty nice people. And God, this is embarrassing. We started we started an internet relationship. I know, I know, I know, I know. Trust me, I know. Um. And so, now here's the problem. When we started to get to know each other, she tells me she's a 28-year-old woman. And I, at this point, was a 16-year-old man, or boy. And I knew that if I told her, hey, I'm 16, um, she would have been like, ah, <laughs> peace. So I made up this ridiculous story, and I'm talking the worst fucking lie that was ever told to anybody on the Internet, ever. 
I, I, I told her I was from New York and I was 23 or 24 years old and that I was living in California with relatives of my, of, of mine. Anyway, we started this internet relationship and I was, uh, to, to be honest with you, she was being completely truthful and she backed it up every way. She said she lived in Arizona or, uh, not Arizona, in, uh, Alaska. She was married, which was, totally cool in my like as a 16 year old i'm like i'm i'm internet fucking somebody else's wife you know looking back on it it was probably a horrible thing to do and if, you know, having been cheated on um god i feel bad about that i regret that <laughs> because that's fucked I don't, I, it is cheating what we did was definitely cheating and she and she would give me he had this uh military phone card and we eventually graduated from the internet um and, and started calling each other and she had this military phone card of his, and she gave me the number, and it was basically unlimited long distance for military people, and I would use it all the time to call her uh, in Arizona. And we started really talking a lot, and then that led to, like, it led to cyber sex. God, I hate that fucking term. <laughs> and I, hate, I hate even more the fact that I did it and apparently was really good at it. Like, apparently, like, and I'm not a writer, should know that about me. I'm much more. I, I'm, I don't write my videos typically. I, I and and when I try and write something, I heard TJ the other day in his answer video talking about the fact that that talking and writing are two different things for him, and he can always encapsulate his his um his uh his thoughts much better on the written page. I'm the I'm the exact opposite. I can speak my thoughts really well, but when I sit down and try and write, it's horrible. But apparently, I'm I'm fuck, I'm Don Juan at that cyber sex shit. I like, woo, she loved it. And then after we started calling each other, that graduated into phone sex, which for a 16 year old kid, and she'd sent me pictures of herself and I was savvy enough on the internet to know that this could not, this may, she maybe really didn't look like this. So I made her like write my, my username on a piece of paper and hold it up. And it could, I guess it could have been that Photoshop wasn't real prevalent back then. And I and I t and she was a really good looking woman. I mean, like way the fuck out of a sixteen year old fat pimply kids league by far. And I this is so fucked up. Fuck it, I'm going it. She asked for a picture of me. I sent I sent her a picture of Chino Moreno, who is the the the, the lead singer of the Deftones, which was one of my favorite bands back then. I found all these like candid pictures of him somewhere on the internet and I sent her those. And so she thought I was Chino Moreno from the Deftones. God damn, what a fucking idiot. See, this is, this is why this question. And so we're having phone sex, which is the coolest thing in the world for a 16 year old kid. Just amazing. But as time went on, she started to develop these really deep feelings for me. And I couldn't d develop the, the same level of feeling for her because I knew I, the entire thing was based on a lie on my end, that I was completely lying. And I knew that I had to end this at some point. But at this point, she had my home, like, I had a private, I had my own phone line in my room downstairs at my dad's house. So I had my own phone number. She had that. I didn't want to have to explain to my dad, I got to change my phone number because I gave my phone number to some woman on the internet who's been, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm like, I'm fucked. So I, it's like one lie begat another lie begat another lie begat another lie to the point where I'm swimming in this ocean of lies. And uh, I had told her my first name, and, I, and, and somehow she figured out my last name. And um, I, maybe I told it to her. I don't know. And she looked it up, and I have the same first name as my dad. I'm a junior. I'm Paul Jr., right? And so she had my first and last name, and so... I at one point decided this is getting too crazy. I stopped taking her phone calls. I put my phone on silent and shit. Didn't talk to her online anymore. And so that, that happened for a couple of days. And then all of a sudden, my dad comes wandering down the stairs at 2 in the morning in his underwear and a wife beater. And I'm out my, on the back porch with my friends, like smoking and talking. And, and he comes downstairs with the phone. By the way, not only did I send her a picture of Chino Moreno, but I told her my name was Trent which was an obvious nod to Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails, which was another big favorite of <laughs> fucking retard. Anyway, my dad comes downstairs, sleepy as fuck, angry, wife beater, you know, uh, skivvies, tidy whities and goes, is there a fucking Trent here? And I was like, <gasps> I was like, 
Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I grabbed it, and he's like, "Tell this, tell this, tell this woman not to fucking call here anymore. Tell her you have your own number." And he hands me the phone, and what do you do? You know what I mean? What do you do at this point? Most of you probably said you come clean. No, no. I got on the phone and made my voice a little higher than it was usual and pretended to be Trent's cousin who lived in the same house. And I was like, oh, yeah, Trent, I haven't seen him in a few days. Completely perpetuated the lie, and for whatever reason, she bought it. This relationship went on way too long. It was like a year and a half. And the way that it finally ended was that, and this is, you know, uh, the whole thing I regret, but this is the this is the really big regret. She calls me one day crying, and she said, I, I just left my husband. And I said, oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. And she said, I left my husband, and she said, I've got family that live in California. I'm coming to California. Here's where I'm going to be. I want you to come see me. Like, I left my husband. I couldn't do it anymore. She's like, I don't know that you and I are going to work out, but I want to try it, so please come and see me, blah, 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 blah. And that was the last time I heard from her. I didn't show up. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that's probably the, the, the most fucked up thing I've ever consciously done and regretted. Um, oh, wow. God, that's, that's terrible. Um, so I think what I'm going to do right now is, you know, you can tell, telling these stories is not the easiest fucking thing in the world. <laughs> I'm going to take a little break and come back and I'll splice these videos together and we will continue with the next question.